So he was afraid of a war story. And then I told him that four years ago at PuppetConf, I gave a talk titled Seven Years of Horror Stories. I'm not <laughs> sure which one he likes. So yeah, um, today we're going to talk about our experience of bringing our internal stack to a new Puppet version. Um, and it, it's partly going to be technical, but it's also partly going to be um, the experience talk. Um, my name is Chris Bertert, that's Lander. Um, there's a slide on that for those who've never seen this. And when um, Martin was doing his initial talk, and when I was the only one raising my hand saying, I like Git submodules, and Bram was also raising it, this is why, apparently. Bram told me, that's because I used to be a developer. Um, all kind of crappy languages. I looked up, it's more than 10 years. Um, <laughs> my current role is I'm the chief trolling officer or the chief travel, well no, Bram has status on KLM, so he's the chief travel officer. Um, at Inuit, we're an open source consultancy company, kind of like NetWays, but we're based in Belgium, the Netherlands, Czech Republic, and Ukraine. Uh, I have a blog which is titled, Everything is a fucking DNS problem. Uh, so when DNS fails, people curse at me, and I organize a little bit too many conferences. And this is Lander. Hi. Um, so I'm also an open source consultant at Inuit, uh, focusing mainly on infrastructure as code, automation, monitoring. And I have a way less impressive track record than as Chris. <laughs> Um, Mostly way shorter. But we, we, yeah. We'll look at it again in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, Puppet. Puppet is a language, it's an ecosystem. And if you write software, you need to maintain it. But it's, it's always a hard discussion with management and customers on, yeah, we need to maintain code, we need to upgrade stuff. Because if you want to migrate to the next version of Puppet, you need to spend a lot of time. And the obvious question you get when you do in year X, you want to go to Puppet N plus X is, what's the business going to get from this? So can anybody answer me what his Puppet migration brought to business? Silence. Wait, cross check. You guys awake? Yes. Okay, I hear some noises at least. Because the next question would be, who's a human being? And if I don't see any hands, then we have a problem. So, yeah, a human being, like... So this is already the first challenge. Why should we upgrade? Who's going to actually give us time to do the upgrade? So that's the first year. Then the second year. Ah, we're on Puppet 3.8. I was really surprised here at first when most of you raised their hands and saying, we're at Puppet 5. If I look at our customer base, and we do consulting to a lot of customers, not only in a Benelux, but abroad, and I can tell you, if I look at the number of machines, I don't think 10% of our deployment space has left the 3.x series. I see some people nodding. Yes, there's people who've been moving, but the majority of deployments I see in the field today are still on 3.7 or 3.8. And that's a massive number. One of the first reasons why we didn't migrate at first, because we needed Foreman. And Foreman wasn't there. Foreman had no support for Puppet 4. We couldn't migrate. So then the next year happened. There's still no additional business value, but Puppet Lab said, hey, this 3.7 thingy, 3.8, sorry, sent off live. And then we started seeing, and this was 2016, we started seeing people who were, hey, we, we, we need to get away from 3.7, 3.8, 2.5, 2.6. We need to migrate. And they started thinking about doing plans. And we saw Martin talk about his migrations, and I was like, hey, he's... He has the beard, so I can tell he's the hippie. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw people migrating, and we did a couple of migrations, small ones. But not really the ones where he said, hey, wow. We had like one customer considering starting to draw a plan and then realizing, well, there's still no business value, we're going to ditch this and not do it. 
because machines are running, we're not adding new topics, we're not having problems. So people weren't migrating. And then this happened. Fox Populi said, well, we're also going to abandon stuff. And we're like, hmm, shit. <laughs> That's not what we like, because we still have a couple of thousand machines with different customers where, well, they're still in the old version. And part of that also was, who still remembers Danny? One of the prominent Puppet community members on Spotify. He wrote this blog post, Goodbye Puppet. He was moving on. And a lot of other people had similar feelings, because who was at OSMC? Who saw Michael's keynote? The keynote of Michael was he declared Nagios dead when Ethan Galstead at some point said Nagios is feature complete. And for a lot of people, Puppet at 3.x was feature complete. And if you read Danny's blog post, you see that a lot of things that were being added and that for a lot of people were perceived as this is why we need to upgrade was basically crap Puppet Labs added which had no additional value to us. They were trying to sell things like, hey, a deployment tool. We've been doing deployment with Puppet for ages. Hey, a tool to do this. Uh, yeah, well, we're not going to use that. So we still didn't see value in actually moving forward, besides the fact that it's a language which you need to maintain, where you need to basically, well, secure your platform and still be up and running. And then 2017 happened. And our test environments sometimes, well, actually we have a Jenkins job that mirrors because also, like Martin said, we don't have unprotected sex with the internet. We have Jenkins jobs that mirror upstream to our local repositories. And sometimes we run tests. And we saw those tests in our trees failing because upstream was actually only working on five or six, uh, five, for both Fox and Puppet Labs. And that was the moment when we were like, okay, so now we really need to in some of those trees, pin versions. And then things started to become more painful. So, Ari started giving talks, because we were huge M Collective fans. And he started saying, hey, this is what I'm doing with Corea. Hmm, that looks interesting, because now we can do more orchestration when we do deployments, less stuff. We were bumping into using Vault and Hera, which was a performance issue. We'll come back to that later. Uh, when we were initially doing Puppet and Vault, Hera doing Vault lookups, it was doing it like Bram explained for pretty much everything, and it was blocking. So imagine the sudden degradation in speed in our Puppet ecosystem. So we abandoned that effort, and we, we started again. And then somewhere early this year, we had like, Okay, but we really, really need the support in the upstream uh, RabbitMQ module, and I really don't want to backboard shit. So we now had a threshold where we need, we actually have a business value to do the migration. And we had a business value. And a lot of people still don't have that business value. If I survey our customers, around 75% of our customer base, and that's not counting the number of nodes, in fact, there are major Puppet deployments, they have no intention of migrating their existing rollouts to a new version of Puppet. What are they doing? They're spinning up some new stack, Puppet 5 somewhere, but the existing code base, they're untouching. Sometimes even worse, they've abandoned Puppet. They've gone to Ansible. They've abandoned configuration management. And I can still see you. <laughs> <laughs> so they stopped doing configuration management completely. They jumped on this new hot trend. They're doing Cube now. They're YAML engineers. And they're not having fun yet. So this is the reality we see out there. We see a number of people who said, hey, we do 
puppet consulting, and this is our only job, whereas we do open source consulting and we deliver stacks which happen to be automated, and we do a lot of it with Puppet. But we don't do it Puppet for Puppet. And a lot of organizations are in that use case. Like, why are you using Puppet? Well, to serve the business. And that's delaying the adoption of new versions sincerely. So let's have a look at the stack we had to migrate. So next to your purely open source consulting, we also run a couple of softwares stacks for our customers. We have a couple of um, software as a service platforms. It's about 20 different platforms, a bit more. Um, they mostly have development acceptance and some have multiple production platforms. Each are mapped to a dedicated Puppet environment, um, which in total ends up at more than 60 platforms. And what we do there is continuous delivery of infrastructure as codes. We leverage pipeline as code to do that. And we do it with about, well, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more, but less than four people. So when we do infrastructure as code, when we do continuous delivery, we actually try to do that by doing continuous integration, doing continuous delivery. And typically our trees look a bit like this. Um, Martin, I don't know if you've done tricks like this, but we have different module paths which clearly indicate what is upstream what is a profile, what is a module, what is a library. We could even maybe call this libraries rather than upstream or side you could do because you can do multiple module parts. So that's what a typical tree looks like. And we use Git sub modules. <laughs> and we're not the only ones because I keep bumping into customers that actually do it without me even being there. Um, and the reason why we did Git submodules is because not only we have to manage Puppet, but we're also doing this kind of a release management for other languages. You'll recognize this. This is an ancient Puppet file. Because if you look at the Git hashes, they're going to be ancient. And what is in there? Pointer to repository and a hash. What's on the other side? A pointer to a git hash. Exactly the same. But our developers know how to use that because that's git and this is a librarian file, this is a puppet file. And they got stuck with a shitload of different Ruby versions and different puppet librarian variants and patched puppet librarian variants. And at some point I had at my laptop three different versions of puppet librarian that didn't work on each tree, and Git worked on each tree. We also don't branch, because we do continuous integration, and if you do continuous integration, then you can achieve continuous delivery, and you can achieve continuous deployment. And if you go back to the roots of continuous delivery, if you read Jess Humble's book, if you go back to what the Agile movement was really meant about, these quotes from J Jess and, and Dave, you don't branch. Because the moment you branch, you're basically hiding inventory. You're hiding value for the organization. And you're basically creating complexity, which you afterwards need to integrate. And when you start merging, you end up in shit. Um, J.D. Depau has a really great talk on why feature branching and branching is evil. I already told Bernd to invite him for our next conference. Why is this important? Why do we do this as ops folks? It's because we help organizations to deploy software, to deliver software, to achieve continuous delivery. But if as an ops organization, you can't achieve that, there's no way you're going to be able to support the developers to do so. So this is our way of working. I got a completely separate talk to do that. Uh, you can probably find recordings. But we do continuous delivery with our infrastructure. So that migration, back to Puppet 5. 6, 7, whatever. I was also surprised when Martin asked who's using containers here that it wasn't that many people. Well, 
we kind of predicted that we at some point needed to upgrade. And we know that when you do software development and you start refactoring code, you need to be able to test what you write and that if you refactor it, you want to have the same results. So that's what we do in a pipeline. So like two years ago, we already were working on automating our pipelines. And this is actually an example of a recently failing pipeline for us, which basically checks out our tree, does tests on version three, does tests on version five, and does tests on version six, so it's kind of recent. And you see that the red ones fail, because for that customer, we don't care, we're on three. But we also have an indication that if it goes green for five, we can actually start migrating it, and we can work towards migrating it. These tests are running in a container. Our pipeline configuration says, run these tests in these versions of containers, typically the current version, the bleeding edge version, and the next one. They're short-lived, they're being thrown away when stuff fails, like Martin explained. And then we basically push this to the different environments. And if this fails, we don't care. We care about the version that's being used. So we were prepared, kinda, because we weren't testing everything. <coughs> we were testing our modules, not upstream. So we were at a point where we decided to migrate. So uh, we spun up, spun up a completely new stack. So. New Puppet Master, new Puppet CA, new Foreman instance, new Puppet TB, uh, added Coria. And um, basically what we did was we took one of our, um, our basically our management environment. Um, and the tests we had in Jenkins, they were all succeeding, or so we thought. Um, because, like Chris already mentioned, we only test the internal modules, not upstream. And all the upstream modules were pinned to a version that supported Puppet 3. So when we tried to apply the code on the Puppet 5 stack, well, those versions, they didn't have Puppet 5 support, and they broke. Um, so what's the logical step? Well, wrote a small shell script, basically loop to every submodule Check out master. Hey. That didn't work either. <laughs> there were uh, some some issues. Um, yeah. I'm going to come back to that. Because um, when we spun up the new stack, also, um, we're like, hey, there's support for uh, SRV records. Maybe we should uh, try that. Because on the old stack, like the, we had three puppet masters, but the load uh, wasn't spread evenly across them at all, so just gonna implement that. Uh, Tim, see the trend? <laughs> it's, uh, it's all nice in theory, but um, when you actually try to implement it with like uh, failover to different data centers and like uh, 60 different environments and all that kind of fun, uh, Turns out you need to manage a lot of DNS records manually, so that's one, one thing we probably going to implement a uh, Bram solution with the console at some point in the future, because, yeah, no. Um, also, PuppetDB, um, the, we use PuppetDB very extensively to configure everything, or monitoring, or uh, reverse proxy, so ingress, uh, database creations. So, what does that mean? Um, if we introduce a new PuppetDB, well, if our load balancers and our monitoring is on the Puppet3 stack, that's not gonna work. If we spin up a new VM, we need monitoring on it, on it. well, if it's in a different PuppetDB, uh, you're not going to be able to export a resource to it. So what, we, what did we decide? Well, let's migrate to a single 2 as well while we're at it. Yeah. Um, 
that's also a <laughs> different story, but it's for a, for a different talk at a different time. Um, so we uh, check out master on every submodule and break all the things because there are some modules which we haven't updated in like two, three years. Uh, stuff doesn't work. Like for example, the pseudo module, just some change like two years ago, um, which introduces uh, some syntax which doesn't work for some reason. I don't know why it hasn't been fixed yet, but Is okay. anybody actually using the pseudo module besides us? Okay. Because uh, it turned out for us, we spun up like 20 VMs and we didn't have root on any of them. <laughs> so start again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's more examples of that, but uh, would be here all day, so <laughs> skip to the next point. Um, next, uh, next issue: How do we call the environments? Well, um, we actually want to keep the same uh, naming uh, because, like, yeah, we we want to move over um, in the future, move everything and move the entire environment over to the Puppet Five Tree. So. Um, that's not really an issue on the Puppet Master itself because it's a completely different environment, completely different stack. They don't know about each other. But yeah, the issue you have then is like, uh, need new Jenkins pipelines, need a new uh, Git repo uh, because we're not gonna do a, a big bang, just push everything in Puppet 5 and hope it works. Um, gonna like migrate over time. But then you have the, the issue that on the Puppet Master, the, um, the environments are called, for example, Management Dev, but the Git repo, the, uh, the pipeline, they're all called Management Dev 5 because naming things is hard. Uh, so that's a bit counterintuitive. Well, all right, that's not, not the end of the world. Then there's also stuff. Um, we have an inventory page which just lists all our VMs with their locations, with which hypervisor they are, stuff like that. And uh, we query Puppet, Puppet DB for that. So um, it's just a script that uh, queries Puppet DB, gets the, the nodes endpoint, and parses it and makes, a, makes it in a, in a, a nice HTML page. Um, so when we're looking at uh, the script, yeah, the, the Endpoint is uh, v4 slash nodes, gives us all the, the information we need. And when we look at the, puppet, the, the new Puppet 5, Puppet DB, um, well, it seems to have moved to a subdirectory, apparently, if you just look at it. But it's subdirectory and then v4 slash nodes. So that should work, no? Well, hmm. Hmm. Spot the difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, I don't have a clue why they changed that, but yeah, for some reason. So that's added complexity in our script. So, uh, well, we can fix that, but yeah, changes like this, uh, I don't get it. Um, all right, so what we did, made a minimum viable product. Uh, Web servers, DVs, load balancers, and Kinga 2. Um, yeah, okay, got that running. Um, now, next step. Remember, we wanted to use uh, Hira and Vault in uh, Puppetry, which didn't really work that well because of. It worked, it was just unbearably yeah, slow. Yeah. yeah, so it didn't work. Um, well, let's try again. There are new new uh, integrations, new stuff. Should be better now. Well, it turns out if you install a Hira Vault plugin, you need a dependency and some, some random gem because we include uh, the Vault gem. And that doesn't really work with the legacy JRuby. So you need to install JRuby 9K. And there are performance issues again. So we start Googling. Find a ticket on Puppet Labs Jara from like a year ago. Uh, this single pixel line is the duration of a Puppet Run when using the 1.7 JRuby. Uh, and if you just turn on 9K, then you get this duration on average. <laughs> hmm. 
Well, and then there are some, some tuning you can do, but it's still like best case with the same heap size. Get here, it's not great, but yeah. You, you, you can you can get some better results with, with tuning. But then get something like this, like it's working fine, it's working fine, then pff, explosion randomly and just shits the bed and there's like 30 minutes, no puppet runs are getting through. So yeah, and turn that back off. Right. We turn that back off. <laughs> it's like the foreman is entirely red. Yeah, new, new things. So current state, um, our management environment. Uh, well, we have two now. <laughs> uh, everything new we introduce is going to Puppet 5. Uh, so some stacks are mixed, some st new stacks are going to be in Puppet 5. But we're not migrating the Puppet 3, not everything. Um, yeah. We're slowly onboarding new stacks which fit patterns that exist. When we build new stacks, they're on Puppet 5, but we're not actually taking old stacks and moving them to a new code base. Because, well, business value. The ones where we need new functionality, we'll do it. But it's going to be a hybrid system. It's going to be a platform where we have a couple. Yeah, that's basically this slide. <laughs> uh, what we're never going to do is take any of the EL6 based environments and move that. Uh, those are just going to end up being EL7 or 8 probably. Um, that's pretty much the state we see for a lot of the Puppet 5, 6, whatever migrations. People just don't want to spend the effort in rewriting the code, which is kind of a pity, but it's what we end up seeing. So that was pretty much our story for uh, how we migrate our internal stack to Puppet 5. But there's one more thing. If you remember the first slide, our organized way too many conferences. It's an addiction Bernd and I share. Um, there's this thing happening in Ghent in February 2019. Some of you might have been there before. Uh, it's right after FOSDEM. I see Tim nodding. Um, so if you're coming to FOSDEM, stick around for like three days for good discussions, more beer. Uh, I think Bernd will bring gin for those who want to. <laughs> um, more beer and a lot of discussions. Our call for paper is open, cfp.configmanagementcamp.be. Um, if that site is down, complain to Toshan. I'm pretty sure I see set it up manually or with Ansible. Um, and I can't fix it, but submit talks. Who didn't submit a talk yet? Do you submit a talk yet? Yeah. yeah the, Martin was the first to submit a talk. <laughs> it's because like, if I see interesting submissions on other conferences, I try to like, grab them. Yeah. So, um, that was pretty much it. I hope to see you all in Ghent. And by the way, uh, there's always good food in Ghent. Belgian waffles, Belgian chocolate. Belgian beer. Basically, uh, the Belgians fry everything, so... No, no, that's the Americans. <laughs> no! <laughs> the Americans fry everything. We don't fry if you, If you pass a street in Belgium, there's always a sign, Knoprige Frittjes. What? Oh, no, that's in the Netherlands. That's Amsterdam. You're confusing. But, but and then it says, I've Lams seen, Fritten. I've like, seen that sign in Ghent. It could be, but you're then in the wrong neighborhoods of Ghent. <laughs> <laughs> I know who to blame, but... So, are there any questions uh, regarding Chris' uh, horror stories? Martin. Oh. <laughs> so, you mentioned you're uh, never branching. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm, just, I'm just interested, how do you deal with new people joining that maybe have not that experience on well, now it's puppet code, but it's independent to which code base it is, so that you can allow them to first try, play around, learn by playing around without breaking your pipelines. Oh, but the pipelines is the indication of the pipelines fail that they need to do something. That's the whole idea. If you break the code, 
your pipeline will be the feedback. And that's the way how they learn things. Um, the, the screenshot I was looking for is, uh, where it is? Where, oh yeah, here it is. We have playgrounds, management play, and they can break whatever they want there. And we won't promote. We only promote when it's green. Uh, the other thing we have is feature toggles, feature flags. This code is only going to be enabled when that flag is on. This code is only going to be run in these, these environments. And we turn it on and off when we need to. So code which isn't ready yet, code which is not finished yet, it's going to be in the tree, but it's not going to be enabled. And the same discussion happens with large features and organizations who say we cannot do continuous deployment because we have regulatory requirements and we can only turn on features then and then. Already deploy the code, but only enable the functionality later. And that's the difference between constantly delivering and actually activating functionality. So you can have broken functionality in a part of the code base which is never being used until you say, now start using it, and then it's green. Okay, so they have the playground and uh, the new people learn something is broken because the pipeline for that they specific get feedback is from red the now. Yeah, uh, how, how do you work with them so that they learn about the new stuff? Because they just broke something, that's fine. Okay, it's not disturbing the production, but now they have to learn how to do it the right way. So, if you remember Bramstock, first step, local vagrant boxes, developing in the vagrant boxes, whatever they do there. So, typically the first time they start pushing code that ends up on a platform that needs to be deployed, the early issues and the syntax issues and the, the thing it doesn't deploy is already solved. So we typically have not that many puppet, not that much puppet code which ends up in deployed puppet trees that is gonna break things. Because they already have things locally, they already have functionality tests, they already have things that work. Um, we do onboarding of our ops folks really well in a way that we show them how things work. Uh, first couple of days they need to actually typically build like one stack, take a new application, simple application or deploy a LAMP application where you say, hey, this is how we package things, this is how we use Rails profiles. Build one like that, which is not going to break anything of the other things, just going to be that isolated environment. And then they learn. And that's how we onboard them. And yes, we had people who definitely were like, ooh, this is a bit awkward. And we definitely have people who forget to push the sub-module each time. And then Jenkins comes in and says, hey, cannot find reference. They can't read it. You do it two times, you're like, OK. And if you do it five times, you still don't do it. Well, there's also this thing called the exit interview. Uh, <laughs> But if, if you want to learn more on how to do those things, trunk-based development, uh, Terry Powell has a really good talk on that. Um, Jess Humble has topics on that. If you look at Dave Farley, if you read the book in continuous delivery, there's a lot of topics on how to do these things. And I, I think it's, it's one of my strong battles that we as ops people need to learn how to do this in order to be able to support the developers into doing this. The, the biggest things I've seen when I was getting Java teams to do continuous delivery is we, they want to go from quarter re-releases to faster releases and the only thing they do is add more branches. So they add more failure. And when you teach them to say, no, no, stop branching, start using feature flags, and forget about you're going to do periodic releases at the end of the week or at the end of the sprint. Just say, every time I do commit, I should be capable of pushing something to the end. Then you start seeing them move forward. And everything in between is basically making it more complex without adding value. And that's not only for operational code, but that's not for ops code, but that's also for Java applications. That's where we, we saw those things happen also. <coughs> more questions? Uh, and by the way, if your Puppet development and deployment workflow involves git commit, git push, and then test, uh, that's not the right order. Please have a look at Vagrant. Uh, there are far, far easier methods to test your code locally with a test VM or even a test cloud with Vagrant. That's what Bram mentioned already. Yeah, yeah. Bram said that already. Because I have too many enterprise customers, especially that ones that are still in Puppet 3, 
um, that do that stuff because they don't have development VMs, they don't have a test VM on their notebook. They're just pushing it to the environment and see hope, hopefully it works. And that can be pretty bad, so please don't do that. More questions? So who's not submitting a talk yet for conflict management camp now? Or at least Did showing up because it's really good. And, and by the way, all the config tools are there, so not just Puppet. Well, um, not all of them anymore, but... And many faces from this room will also be there. Some of them are slowly dying, they won't show up anymore. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Chris. And